the kids in to service at the start of service. We're doing that all summer. We're trying that out at least through the summer to find out uh, how we like it and how it goes and give our kids a chance to worship with us. So we're going to continue doing that. We're going to do that today. So right now, the fours and the fives and those in the Elevate class, you guys can get up. Your teachers are in the back. And parents, you can pick those kids up from their classrooms right after service. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for today. We want to ask that you prepare our hearts as we come before you. That your message, which has been valid for thousands of years and continues to be valid, would touch our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. As some of you guys know, I, uh, I recently had to have surgery on my leg. And so I, uh, I went through this process of surgery and, and all of the fun doctor's appointments that come afterwards. And I wanted, to, I wanted to do something to make it happen faster. You guys been that way when you go to the doctor? And so I'm, I'm, I was constantly asking the doctor, you know, what, what can I do? And of course his answer was, you can give it some time to heal, which I didn't really like. And so I finally, the, the doctor after three or four appointments says, well, you're, you can do these exercises. You've healed enough. And I said, great, how many can I do? You can do some. Okay, but how many? Well, don't do too many. Okay, but how many? So I couldn't get an answer. So I was like, oh, I'll come up with my own number. So I went home, and I started doing 1,000 a day. <laughs> I went back to the doctor a week or two later, and the nurse is checking me in. She says, are you doing your exercises? I said, absolutely. I'm doing 1,000 a day. She gives me this look. This horrified look like, are you an idiot? And I'm like, well, how many am I supposed to be doing? Hoping that I'm finally going to get the answer of how many exercises I'm supposed to be doing. And she says, not that many. <laughs> See, I have this personality, like some of you that I know. And, and I like to define things and get them lined out and get them in order. It, give me the numbers. I want the check boxes. You tell me how many, I'll go get that done. It's the problem with healing, with tissue, with this organic thing called surgery. There's no exact anything. It's, it's dynamic and it's different, and every surgery is different, as the doctor told me. And every tendon is different, and every person is different. There's no set rule. But I want to be in control of things, particularly the time frame. It doesn't always work out that way, unfortunately, for me. And this story that we just read about the sower and the seeds is a parable from Jesus. It's a message type that Jesus uses throughout his ministry. You know, one of the first things to note about this is that this is one of the few parables that shows up in three of our four Gospels. So our Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are four different eyewitness accounts written at different times by different people about the life and ministry of Christ. This parable shows up in three of them, in Mark 4, which we just read, in Luke 8, in Matthew 13, almost verbatim. That should be unique to us, because it's unique in the Gospels, and it should mean some significant things to us, that people writing with different flavors and perspectives in life, separated by time and geography, managed to remember a specific parable from Christ, and not only the parable, but his explanation to them afterwards, almost word for word. If you leave here today and you understand what Jesus was attempting to explain to that crowd and to his apostles in this parable, you'll not only have uncovered the joy of what Christ calls salvation, but here's, you will understand the formula that is Christian growth towards spiritual maturity. This is the key to Christian growth beyond all of those things you've heard in church, the stuff you're supposed to do. And like the great mysteries of the universe, Jesus explains it to us with a simple story about a farmer and some seeds. I'm going to give you a little bit of background to this story. We read that Jesus has a multitude in front of him. In fact, the crowd is so great that he has to get on a boat and he has to push off from shore so that he has room to speak. But prior to that speaking event, Jesus has gone through confrontations with the Pharisees. 
the religious scholars of that time, the ultra-religious, as it were. And in the midst of that turmoil, Jesus' mother and siblings have demanded private access, a private audience with Jesus. And then while that's going on, he's still healing the sick, and he's casting out demons, and he's doing miracles, and he's attempting to teach and get this message through. And Jesus is still being misunderstood. And so we find him here on the beach with a simple story. Jesus tells us about a farmer who sows the seed, and then he explains the story for his apostles. The seed, Jesus tells us, is the word. It's the Son. It's the Savior. It's this gospel message. Jesus uses the analogy of a seed multiple times in the Gospels. He explains the power of a seed. He talks about a seed having to die before it can produce life. We're given many examples of the salvation process being paralleled to a seed that Jesus died and was buried and rose again and produced abundant life. But I want to look at the soil because the soil in this story, the soil's you and me. I'm going to read some translations today from the message. It's just very simple English. Oops, too far. In verses 4 through 8, Jesus mentions four types of soil that the seeds fall on. Here's from the message translation. Listen, what do you make of this? A farmer planted seed. As he scattered the seed, some of it fell on the road and birds ate it. Some fell on the gravel. It sprouted quickly but didn't put down roots. So when the sun came up, it withered just as quickly. Some fell on the weeds. As it came up, it was strangled among the weeds and nothing came of it. Some fell on good earth and came up with a flourish, producing a harvest exceeding his wildest dreams. These are examples of the types of hearts, or we could translate that to say the types of attitudes that Christ typically experienced when he attempted to share the secret to salvation and life. In fact, Jesus had been experiencing these exact attitudes prior to this parable with his family, with religious scholars, and with the public. If we dig a little into these four types of conditions or, or four types of receivers, in fact, let's call them the four heart conditions. Jesus is going to explain how different people receive the message. And I want you to see if you can find the common problem with three of them. There's going to be a quiz afterwards. Verse 4 of the message. A farmer planted seed. As he scattered seed, some of it fell on the road and birds ate it. And Jesus explains this in verses 14 to 15. The farmer plants the word. Some people are like seed that falls on the hardened soil of the road. No sooner do they hear the word than Satan snatches away what has been planted in them. You know, in the end of uh, chapter 12 of John, Jesus is really frustrated as he's sharing the message. And people aren't listening. He says, you know, this is a fulfillment of a prophecy from Isaiah a thousand years ago. Jesus said this. This is actually from verses 36 through 40. And went into hiding and all these God signs he had given them and they still didn't get it and they still wouldn't trust him. This proved that the prophet Isaiah was right when he said, there are, their eyes are blinded, their hearts are hardened so that they wouldn't see their eyes and perceive with their hearts and turn to me, God, so I could heal them. The first condition of the heart is that it is hardened and therefore the message of Christ can't even reach the soil. What's a hard heart? One illustrator put it like this. Some folks are like Easter eggs. They're all decorated on the outside and hard-boiled on the inside. Hard hearts make it easy for us to remove ourselves from the application of the message. There's a young, fearless preacher, and he had a problem with one of his parishioners. Every Sunday, the man would, would come shake his hand after the service at the door and declare, You really told them today, preacher. Sunday after Sunday, the fellow always managed to convince himself that the message was for somebody else. So, one winter, there's a snowstorm, and the only two people in church are the pastor and this one man. So he changes his whole message, and he gives him a blazing salvation message. Right afterwards, the guy comes out and says, Hey, preacher, you would have really got him if they'd shown up today. In Jesus' time, 
Pharisees and the Sadducees had hardened their heart against the message. And that we know of from reading the Gospels, very few of the ultra-religious ever came to know Christ. It could be that way for us too. Billy Graham said, most people in America have just enough religion to keep them from getting the real thing. It's like they've inoculated themselves against Christianity. We use hard hearts to defend against God's message. The Bible has hundreds of references of people hardening their hearts so that they can ignore God. You could go back to the story of Moses and Pharaoh hardening his heart. A second type of soil. In verse 5 it says, Some fell on the gravel. It sprouted quickly, but it didn't put down roots. So when the sun came up, it withered just as quickly. And Jesus explains in verse 16, And some are like the seed that lands in the gravel. When they first hear the word, they respond with great enthusiasm. But there is such shallow soil of character that when the emotions wear off and some difficulty arrives, there's nothing to show for it. Jesus speaks multiple times in parable and others about both roots in sand or gravel, something shallow. In fact, Christ is exceptionally critical of shallow faith. I define shallow faith as this. It's a belief system that will impact your daily life as little as possible. A few weeks ago, a friend of mine and I, we took our kids out to Lake Isabella to fish on a, off a boat, and they wanted to go swimming because it was hot. I said, sure, we strapped all the life vests on. And I jump out in the water, and we're lowering the kids in, and my little one, she's four, She's clinging to my arm. And I said, Bea, what? you're floating. It's fine. What's going on? She goes, Daddy, don't let me go. I said, why? Why? You're just floating. She said, the fishies might suck on my toes. <laughs> See, that's the thing about deep water or being in the deep end of the pool as a kid. Well, there's some danger involved when you get really invested. There's risk. It's much easier to stay in the shallow end of the pool. But God doesn't do a lot of work in the shallow end. Without a root system, without a foundation, faith is useless. In fact, Christ would say it isn't really faith. By the way, if you're following along in your bulletin, hint the red words filled in. Okay. Verse 6 says, Some fell in the weeds, and as it came up, it was strangled among the weeds, and nothing came of it. And Christ explains in verse 18, he says, The seed cast in the weeds represents the ones who hear the kingdom news, but are overwhelmed with worries about all things they have to do and all things they want to get. The stress strangles what they hear, and nothing comes of it. I relate well to this one. You see, weeds are the other things growing in our lives. Other priorities, other concerns, things we allow to take away from the gospel. Sometimes this is easily apparent. Like the guy who was being hounded by his buddy to go to a small group. Every week, you need to come to a small group. Right? You can really grow in Christ. And he keeps telling him, look, come on, come on, come on. The guy just stays on him. Every week, but he goes, you know, I, look, I gotta, I gotta, I'm juggling a demanding job. I've got a heavy mortgage. Bills are piling up. I have trouble with my wife. I'm raising kids. This guy's like, no, you need to get into a small group. You can grow with Christ. And finally, he just snaps at him and goes, look, I don't have time for Jesus right now. I'm kind of busy. Oh, well, he's right. Because a lot of weeds make it impossible for a seed to grow. I know. I deal with this all the time. Verse 8, some fell on good earth and came up with a flourish, producing a harvest, exceeding his wildest dreams. And in verse 20, Jesus says, but the seed planted in good earth represents those who hear the word, embrace it, and produce a harvest beyond their wildest dreams. We don't know what good soil looks like. What we know about good soil is that it produces fruit, and a lot of it. What's fruit? Well, Galatians 5 tells us in verse 22 and 23, fruit is Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. We recognize health in Christian life, good soil, by the production of fruit. I want you to remember that that's 
That's how we recognize it. We'll get back to that. Here's the first secret of understanding this parable. And this is where we typically have all taken a right turn and gone off somewhere else. Generally, when we read this parable, we stage it as this. Christians, good soil. Non-Christians, bad soil. Hmm. Okay. Maybe. The soil issue isn't just about understanding the word and receiving Christ initially, our salvation. It's about ongoing life with Christ. Uh, I, I want to illustrate this to you. Tim Keller is an excellent preacher in New York. And he calls this the mechanical versus the organic. And I wanted to use something a little more fun, so I called it robots versus aliens. But either way. We're aiming for a change in our lives that is so fundamentally different that we are completely changed. That's the goal. If we looked at robots or aliens, we'd probably say both of them are very different than humans, different than us. But a robot gets, gets to that point in a very different manner. It's an artificial manner. It's a mechanical manner. And unfortunately, in, in religion, we pick a mechanical, almost robotic procedure to try to make these changes. You could look at any religion in the world, and you're going to find the same thing. I have this list of things that I must do. I have to pray to Mecca a certain number of times a day. I've got to work on increasing my karma so that when I reincarnate, I can move up a level. I've got to say a hundred Hail Marys. Even in good old Western Protestantism, I've got to wear the right clothes and sing the right songs and show up and check my boxes and do blah, 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 and blah. And if I do that, I can get out of here by 11.15 and we can have lunch. <laughs> the thing about aliens is that they're also different, but we're talking about a change you can't manufacture, an organic change. Romans 12.2 tells us not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed, not of this world. How does this organic change take place? Well, I'll give you the first hint. It happens as the seed grows, and surprise, that seed growing, you, we, we don't have the power over that. It's not for us to determine that time frame. That's the difference. We can't control the growth, unfortunately, though I'd like to, or the time frame. So how do we grow? It, it certainly isn't with lists, mantras, edicts, religious laws, check boxes. I mentioned early, earlier there was a similarity between three of the types of soil. You know, the similarity is depth. You see, shallow ground or gravel, it doesn't allow the seed to get down where it needs to be. And that's also the problem with the hardened surface. That's the hardened, hardened surface. That's why it can't be protected from the birds who come and pick away the seed. It can't, there's no depth to that. And see, the problem with weeds is not that the seed doesn't get deep enough, but rather that the weeds get to the same level as the seed. I have a depth issue. You know, when weeds get down to that level, do you know what they do? They rob the seed of the resources it needs to grow. See, the big secret to this parable for Christians who have already found salvation is that everything in Christian life is focused on preparing the soil so that the seed can do what it was already meant to do, which is grow in you or preparing the soil in others. That means that all of these things that you've learned about church, let's tick them off. Bible study, small groups, tithing, praising God's service, Ministry, servanthood, sharing the gospel. I made a list for you. All that's not to earn you some merit in Christian circles. It's not to make you feel better, although it, it might. All of these things we talk about doing behaviorally in Christian life is to do one of three things. Soften hard soil, push the seed deeper, or pull weeds out of the garden. The things you have control of, they're gardening tools. You thought you bought those at Home Depot. It may be the soil of your heart. It may be the soil of a heart of a person that God has really targeted to minister to. But at times, we misconstrue these behaviors and tasks as something completely out of character, that they're earning us something. This is where the mechanical versus the organic comes in. You see, these are the things we have control over. 
these are our tools to help prepare a heart for Christ to produce amazing fruit through his gospel seed. The mechanical mistake made again and again is that we think that if we have checked these boxes and we're doing these tasks, that we've already grown and therefore we've, we've already produced all of this fruit. That's pride. Only the power of Christ in me allowed to work over time, time being a really critical element in a garden, can produce anything. Listen, we can manufacture some amazing things in the United States. But the thing about fake fruit is it may look great. It may look authentic, but it won't pass the taste test. Only fruit grown organically will. You can't robot your way through this. It's just not a mechanical process. What you and I can do with our, our serving, our tithing, our Bible study, our quiet time, our ministries and servanthood, our small groups, is we can prepare the soil for the growth that God has already promised us that's inherent in the gospel. Uh, let me ask you to consider a few things about your own experience that if you've ever been in church, you've probably gone through. And I ask how you view this. Do you consider tithe and offering when you write out that check for 10%? Are you thinking of how God is using that for you to burn down some of those weeds that are priorities in your life? Or are you thinking of, well, I'm helping the church out? Because I'll tell you, my wife and I, for a long time, and we grew up with, in households that tithe, thought of it as helping the church out. A task to check a box. What God begins to reveal is that He uses that in a way to prepare your heart for something else. When you serve others, are you struck by, the comp by compassion when you realize something that they're going through? Because God's using that oftentimes, not just you ministering to them, but to soften your heart to receive the seed that is the gospel. I thought when God called me to teach a Sunday school class that it was because we needed a Sunday school class. And that may well be, but God called me to teach Sunday school class because he needed to change some stuff in here, and that was a mechanism to till up some soil. When you go through trials and tough times, God is forcing you to, into the deep end of the pool so that your faith may be more firmly rooted. But oftentimes when we have trials and we have problems, that is not what we're thinking about. We're thinking, why do I have these problems? These things aren't things you can, you can check off. Well, they might be, but they don't work in that way. They serve a purpose. The ultimate purpose is preparing your heart for growth. The, the fact that the gospel which is very simple, is that Jesus lived a blameless life and he died on a cross for you and me while we were still sinners. And if you accept him, a life with Christ can lead to the most amazing of lives. He can produce in us that fruit, love, joy, peace, kindness, and more. But how many times in your life has the sower thrown that seed and landed on your hard heart rather than in your fertile soil? I want you to take a quick look at your own life. In fact, let's say two weeks. You back up and you think about the last 10 days, 14 days, somewhere in that range. Is there someone or something that God keeps putting in your life over and over again, a person or a task or a calling, and you know you need to do it, but you're avoiding it? I want you to consider that the reason that's occurring is that God may be trying to soften some soil in your heart, not just accomplish some task. Is there a problem you continue to face that seems too difficult? A reoccurring addiction or a habit that you can't seem to shake? A mountain that looks too hard to climb? Is God forcing you back into the deep end of the pool until he gets the reaction that he wants? Because I'm going to tell you, you're going to continue to get pushed into the deep end of the pool and feel like it's a problem until you react in the way he wants, which is you finally put some roots down. And if you think, oh, no, I, I just solved the problem, you're going to find that you get pushed back out there again. It's like teaching your kid to swim. You just keep throwing them in the deep end. Sooner or later, they're going to swim. Are you getting thrown in the deep end and wondering why? Or like, like mine, does your garden have a weed problem? Is the gospel drowned out in your life 
because other things take priority? Is your money or your job choking out the growth of the seed in your life? Because maybe it's time to identify some of those and have a little weed pulling party. I want you to bow with me and pray. Lord, I ask that you help us to not have hard hearts. That as we read your message and we hear it and you show it to us, that we can apply it to our own lives. God, I ask that you would pierce the hardened heart of each of us as, as we attempt to deflect what the message is. That we wouldn't allow the seed to be shallow. That we wouldn't allow weeds to choke it out. And I ask you that we could learn real application of your message. In Jesus' name, amen. I have a great story. It's a pastor that was caught in a flood in New Orleans. And so he climbs up on top of the church roof and he prays to God, God, please save me from this flood. And about 10 minutes later, a boat comes by. And the guy says, hey, do you need help? And he says, no, it's okay. I prayed. God's going to save me. I'll be good. The boat goes on by. About 10 minutes later, another boat comes by. And he says, hey, do you need help? And the guy says, no, no, it's, it's good. I, I prayed. God's going to take care of this. So the boat leaves. So about 10 minutes later, a helicopter comes by, and it's the Coast Guard. And they drop a rope down, and he waves them off. No, it's okay. I prayed God's going to take care of it. And eventually, the floodwaters rise, and he dies. So he's at the pearly gates. And Peter greets him there. And he says, I don't understand. I prayed. Why didn't you save me? And Peter says, we sent two boats and a helicopter. It's very easy to deflect the message. It's about somebody else. Sometimes it's very hard to accept the fact that God's speaking to us. I see you do that today. Thanks.